So today I'm going to be talking about uh, slices and CPU caches and how to take advantage of uh, how they interact uh, when, when we're writing performant code. So this is a slice. Uh, it's a pointer to a block of memory, a length field, and a total capacity. The length field tells us how many, entry, how many entries are valid. The capacity tells us what the total block uh, that has been allocated is. Both of these numbers are counts and are relative to the size of the elements uh, in the slice in order to be turned into bytes. And we can find out how big that is with the size of operator. Um, here we're taking the address of the 14th element of a slice and then doing some math uh, to figure out uh, where that uh, is in memory, and press run. It fails to tell, oh, there it is. It um, tells us that they are, in fact, at the same address. Uh, that calculation is what the compiler basically does every time you access a slice element. Uh, there are bounds checks to make sure that the, that the address actually lies within the block that's been allocated. The SSA backend is doing its best to remove these bounds checks where possible, but the uh, branch predictor in your processor will figure out that most of these pass, and so they end up being essentially free. Uh, you can also append to a slice. Uh, if there's space left, then the element you've added will just be you know, tucked in the end there. Uh, otherwise, a new chunk of memory will be uh, allocated, the contents of the old slice will be copied over uh, to the new one, and then your element will be added to the end. Uh, in order to keep this uh, fast and basically uh, amortized constant time, the capacity of the new slice that's allocated is uh, twice the length of the old one. Uh, and we can see here this code is from the uh, slice.go package in the runtime, or the slice.go file in the runtime package. If there's less than uh, 1024 elements, then it's actually doubled. Otherwise, the growth factor is 1.25. Uh, it's actually pretty cool. You should benchmark this when you get home and show that it actually does work, because it's, it's kind of neat the way that uh, theory and practice uh, actually match up here. Uh, of course, if you know how big your slice is going to be, uh, just allocate the entire thing up front. Uh, you can still use append, but it will save the extra copying and the GC pressure from having to throw away the old slices that are now too small. Uh, append is also getting faster in 1.8. Uh, there was a small patch to runtime grow slice, which is the function that this code came from. Uh, what the old copy, what the old version was doing, was uh, clearing the entire block of memory before returning it to append, which is then going to copy over the majority of that slice that had just been zeroed. Uh, now it only zeroes out the memory that is not going to be overwritten, uh, and that's about a 10 to 15 percent speed up in benchmarks, which is nice. So, you know, slices are very convenient, they are dynamically sized arrays, you have, you know, order one append, bounds checks on all the accesses, uh, length and capacity are part of the slice, so they never get out of sync, which obviously is a big issue, you know, with people who have done, uh, you know, C. Um, all the basics are covered in these two blog posts, uh, and as homework, you should go and read the, the slice.go package, again, in the runtime. Uh, package. Um, but to, for today's talk, I really only care about the, 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 the data field, uh, which is the you know, large block of continuous bytes in memory. But in order to make sense of that, we need a brief digression on computer hardware. Moore's law says that the number of transistors in a processor doubles every 18 months. Uh, you can see on this graph where single core performance plateaued, uh, and so now manufacturers are scaling things by adding multiple cores. And this, of course, is why languages like Go are interesting. The bottom line on the graph is the rate at which RAM speed is increasing, much, much slower. So in order to compensate for this huge speed difference, uh, you know, processors have multiple levels of caching. So, uh, this is, uh, you know, a slide made famous by uh, Jeff Dean. We've all seen it in various forms. The original numbers were from 2003, but they've, they've been, they have been updated more or less since then. Uh, I've highlighted uh, the three timings for the cache references here. You know, 0.5 nanoseconds for an L1 cache reference, uh, 7 nanoseconds for an L2 cache reference, and 100 nanoseconds for a main memory reference. So an order of magnitude bigger, but an order of magnitude slower. Uh, my laptop has two 32 kilobyte uh, L1 caches, two 256 kilobyte L2 caches, three megabytes of L3 cache, and 16 gigabytes of main memory. Let's do some quick calculations here. 
if, let's say you have a three gigahertz processor, and that means that there are three cycles every nanosecond. If your processor can complete four instructions per cycle, which is not unreasonable, then in the 100 nanoseconds it takes to fetch a cache line from main memory, you've just stalled for 1,200 instructions. You can do a lot in 1,200 instructions. So while we can process data faster than ever before, the bottleneck is now on getting data to the processor. Which means that a processor, which means that a program that plays nicely with all these different caches is going to be faster than one that can't. And according to the timings, sometimes orders of magnitude faster. So here's a little snippet of code. Uh, off the slide, I have uh, allocated 128 megabyte of uh, N32s. And we're going to do some math with all the elements uh, and then print it out. And I'm going to increment every element, and then we're going to do it again, incrementing every other, every other element, every third element, every fourth element, and so on. And then we'll get up to, I think, every thousand elements. So you know, you would you would expect that if I'm doing less operations, then uh, then this loop should actually complete faster. But it's not. So in order to access a single element. Uh, we have to pull in an entire cache line, which is 64 bytes of memory. And that's coming from, well, hopefully, hopefully your L1 cache, but uh, eventually it will be coming from main memory. Uh, and that's actually what is the slow part. So on this graph, we can see that you know, incrementing every other element is about the same speed as implement, incrementing every third element or every fourth element or every 16th element, right up, in, and that's the entire length of a cache line. So accessing the other elements in the cache line is basically free. The expensive thing is accessing a new cache line. And it's only once we start accessing fewer cache lines that our program starts speeding up. This graph looks roughly the same for in16s and in64s, a different number of elements, but it's still the same 64 bytes. So if accessing the elements in the same cache line is free, let's see how to use this. But first, some theory. So back to school, algorithms, complexity analysis. I mean, we've all had these facts pounded into our heads. Accessing a map element is order one. Binary search is log n. Iterating over a list is order n. You know, sorting is n log n. But there are two things that people forget when uh, you know, discussing big O notation. One, there's a constant factor involved. You know, two algorithms which have the same algorithmic, algorithmic complexity uh, might have different constant factors. Imagine uh, one program that runs over a loop once, or runs over an array once, versus running over it 100 times. They're both going to be linear time algorithms, but one is going to have a constant factor that's 100 times bigger. The second thing that people forget is that big O only says as numbers get big, as n grows to infinity. Uh, this is the factor that's going to dominate the runtime. There's, f there's frequently a cutoff point below which a dumber algorithm is faster. A nice example of this is from the, uh, the Go standard library's sort package, where, well, most of the time it's quick sort. Uh, when it falls below 12 elements, it will do a shell sort pass followed by insertion sort. So back to some code. Let's talk about storing a set of integers. If I just had to remember a single integer, I'd probably use a variable. A map would be overkill. If I had Two variables, or sorry, if I had two integers, well, maybe two variables, but that would kind of get ugly. Um, at some point, you're going to have you know, a slice of them, and you say, well, if I just want to check membership, maybe I'm going to use a map, because a map is order one, and searching through my list of elements is going to be order n. So the question is, where is that cutoff where a map becomes faster than searching through an array? So I've benchmarked this for you, and here's the graph. So from a performance perspective, we can see the cutoff is at about 30 elements. Before that, a slice is faster. That just means that the constant associated with accessing a map element is more expensive. Uh, now, this obviously comes with a lot of caveats. The first one is that it only works with integers. Uh, strings require not only additional pointer dereference, because the body that you need to uh, compare against is, another point, is, is, is farther away. It's not in line in your slice. And also, comparing two strings is more expensive. You have to go byte by byte, as opposed to just the single instruction it takes to compare two integers. Um, and so for strings, the constant factor shifts. A map is always faster than even a single uh, uh, slice. It, it, it never crosses over. What if it's sorted? Well, sort.search is kind of expensive because you have this extra function call it has to do on every iteration. You can't really get above 10 or 20 elements before a map is faster. But you can inline the binary search code. This is always dangerous. Binary search is notoriously tricky to get right. But, and that's why there's one in the standard library called sort.search, which you should use. 
But performance is important. You can do dangerous things. With a custom binary search on my laptop, I can get up to about 1,500 integers before a map is consistently faster. And in fact, a binary search on a regular sorted array isn't even that cache friendly. There are other layouts that can make this even faster. So, another more complicated example here. This is from a great article by Bjarne Strostrup called Software for Infrastructure. Problem statement is we're going to generate n random integers uh, and then insert them in sorted order uh, into a sequence. So if our sorted orders, if our sorted numbers that we've, if the numbers we are generating are you know, 5, 1, 4, 2, then we will have 5, then 1, 5, then 1, 4, 5, 1, 2, 4, 5. And then we will remove them again by generating a random position in the list to remove. So let's consider, consider two standard implementations here, right? A slice or a linked list. For the slice, we have to find the right position, which we can do easy enough with the binary search. But then inserting the element requires shifting every other element uh, over to make, to make room for it. Same thing for uh, removal. Easy enough to find the spot, but expensive to remove. For a linked list, we still have to find the spot, but the insertion and deletion are constant time operations. You just flip a couple of pointers. So that should be much, fa much faster. But what does this look like when we actually run it? Well, not so good for the linked list. I ran this up to 500,000 elements, and the linked list simply never caught up. And in fact, it just kept getting worse. All of those order and traversals were chasing pointers, which ended up being cache misses. And the constant factor on that is pretty high, as we saw before with the timing slide. In the slice version, the CPU is very good at copying memory around. The constant factor for that is about as low as it can get to do that much work. And even if we don't use a binary search, just a regular linear scan through the array, then the CPU will prefetch all of that memory and we won't have any stalls. So it still ends up being faster. Now, this graph is a little misleading because it's log scale on both axes. Like, here's what happens if I make the x-axis linear. So at 200,000 elements, the slice version took 12 seconds and the linked list version took 4 minutes and 8 seconds. At 500,000 elements, the slice version took 1 minute 22 seconds, and I killed the linked list version because I was tired of waiting. Now, this is obviously an artificial example, um, but this does happen in practice. Algorithms with faster theoretical numbers are drowned out by the constant factors due to all the pointer chasing and the poor use of cache. So, what can we learn from this? Is the conclusion, always use a slice? Well, kind of. Like all benchmarks, these ones have flaws. The real issue here is that in all these cases, we're not doing any work. Our benchmarks are entirely dominated by data access time. If we did some computation at each step, uh, even something as dumb as calling a very fast random number generator, we can very easily shift our program from being bound by data access to being bound by computation. Now, we all know how to optimize CPU-bound programs. We profile, we choose a more efficient algorithm, right? we can do less work. Um, but how do you optimize programs that are bound by data access? Well, first you have to recognize this is happening. PProf will tell you which routines are taking up most of the time. Uh, but it's hard to know if that time is wasted because of cache misses or just other stuff going on. Uh, KcacheGrind will tell you, and perf, uh, the Linux perf utilities will also tell you uh, what your cache or miss rates are uh, for, for your program and for your benchmarks that you're running. Uh, once you have some rough numbers, then you can begin. The two basic strategies are store less data and access the memory in a, predict in a predictable manner. So for if, you can, if you store less data, then you can fit more data into your cache. Um, I, I had one program that I sped up about 15% by changing a slice that I was accessing very frequently from a slice of int 64s to a slice of int 32s. Um, and simply because you know, all of that data was faster to get into the cache because there was less of it. Um, for, uh, and that actually applies to structs as well. Uh, you know, remove fields that you don't need, uh, reorder th the fields to uh, eliminate the struct padding, uh, and there are tools that can help you with that. So to access memory in a predictable manner, uh, you know, searching through an array linearly is predictable access. Uh, shifting the elements over one, over, over one you know, is predictable memory access. Uh, traversing the linked list is not. Modern processors have, uh, have a prefetcher that will look for patterns in memory access and fill the cache with the data that it thinks you're going to need so that you don't have to wait as long. But it can't predict pointer traversal because that's going somewhere random. 
So now you know how to optimize for cache usage. But should you actually do this? Well, the point that I want to leave you with is this. Modern, modern compilers and computers have gotten very good at executing simple, dumb algorithms quickly. So that's where you should start. These benchmarks, as artificial as they were, are indications of why. Simple algorithms tend not to have too much baggage. A list of things, maybe a counter or two. Simple algorithms tend to have predictable access patterns, scanning through arrays, copying values around. Here are some rules from Rob Pike's Notes in C programming from 1989. First one says, well, the third one, I guess, says, fancy algorithms are slow when n is small, and n is usually small. Fancy algorithms have big constants. Until you know that n is frequently going to be too big, don't get fancy. You know, what n needs to be big in order to, so what n needs to be in order to be considered small is getting bigger all the time. The second one says, fancy algorithms are buggier than simple ones, and they're much harder to implement. Use simple algorithms as well as simple data structures. So I think that's what I want to leave you with. Simple, use simple algorithms and simple data structures, and it might still be fast. Thanks. <laughs>